Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Simeon Morrow Executive Communications Coaching and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please turn off your camera and set your microphone. Please turn off your camera and microphone and or go to the Facebook live video feed, the link to which I'll now place in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. Tonight, our featured guest is Matthias Lichtenthaler, an expert in managing digital and innovation projects and head of digital transformation at the Austrian Federal Computing Center. Also joining us tonight is Dr. Lino Rivera, Professor of Music at St. Mary's College of California. Matthias, welcome. Welcome, nice to be on the show. So Matthias, tell us a little bit about where you come from and your path to becoming an expert in managing digital and innovation projects. So I, I'm actually, so actually, first of all, it's nice to be here. I'm actually, um, half German, half Austrian, by the way. So I grew up primarily in Germany, but my American accent is based upon my father's experience as a guest professor in Berkeley, California. So um, that's that's uh, the reason why I'm, I do not necessarily have a typical German accent in, in English, you know what I mean? Um, so uh, I can, <laughs> uh, I, can, I can imitate that, but it's probably not a smart idea to talk to. Uh, some Germans about in, in that manner. Um, so, and I moved to Vienna like 11 years ago now. And, but my mother is from this city and um, I've been with Accenture before and a variety of smaller companies in the, in the 2000, um, 2000s, so to say. And, um, you know, I studied laws. So something quite different which is not necessarily connected to IT or digital. But, um, you know, uh, as I, I was being asked by Accenture to lead a department in the interface between legal IT and business, I kind of like, yeah, 11 years ago, pretty much, I, I 10 years ago, I, I kind of, you know, switched into the digital world, so to say, like building up this digital department, even within Accenture. and. And finally, in 2016, I was being asked to take over as a head of digital government and innovation, uh, building up a digital transformation department based upon existing e-government solutions at the Federal Computing Center um, in, in Austria, responsible for the entire IT and, and digital solutions for the government in Austria. And so Matthias, tell us about this being a lawyer and then moving into a project manager at Accenture. I mean, uh, isn't it normally, it's, a, it's the project management is extremely competitive that um, this uh, being a consultant and all that, it's, you, you need a training for it. How did, how did that all come about? And what exactly does that mean? What, what exactly do you, do you do as a project manager? Well, I mean, I was, uh, from the first, very beginning of my my studies, um, I initially wanted to study music, by the way, composition um, and, and, and conducting, uh, but due to a broken wrist that didn't work way back then, even though I can I can I can play now and um, violin and piano, but um, but so the plans were a little different way back then. And that's why I decided to study law, which was not uh, my, my dream illusion, so to say, but it was an opportunity to uh, study something quite in a structured approach. And my core intention was, or my, my interest was always like IT anyway, 
even using notation software like 30 years ago on the Amiga with a MIDI interface, you know, that was, it looked, the interface looked slightly different than the interface looked today, um, but it was, it was fun. So IT, music and media law, that's what, what I was focusing on concentrating on. Most of the others were kind of reluctant to specialize. So I was able to specialize because I wanted to do it. Um, with the downside that if there's somebody talking about, you know, any other topic in, in law, then they wouldn't necessarily contact me, which is fine. And so that's why I'm an expert here. And this is how I moved into project management and you, you learn how to, how to work in a structured approach. And this is how I ended up um, in this interface between legal IT. I was kind of the, the interpreter between a hardcore technical person and a, a legal guy. They would eventually speak German, both, you know, or, or English or whatever, but they would not necessarily be able to understand what they are talking about. Um, and that's the, this mediation type of approach, interpreter type of approach was something I, I liked. And um, this is how I ended up with Accenture. And then, then I moved into a, this whole digital field. And Matthias, so if I got it right, you got into digital uh, work, working with computers and all that through music. It was through those composing software, uh, kind of the same thing as Microsoft Word would be for text. You were uh, working with those those kind of uh, digital composition software programs, and that's what got you uh, got you in, so to say, into the digital realm. It was at least an important part. I mean, I was always uh, keen to to learn something about IT, a little bit of programming, but I'm not a programmer. Um, but yes, I mean, it was an opportunity to to play something on a on a digital keyboard even, you know, in 1990, um, and via the media interface, it was possible to um, uh, to put it on, a, on sheet music. Um, it was not perfect, but it was, it was a starting point. But even apart from that, I was interested in technology in general, even though at that point, nobody was talking about digital. But um, I was interested in solutions to, to facilitate even, for example, work, um, the, the, the daily work of, of people or citizens or whatever. So that was always my interest. And today, this is beneficial because there's an interface between DuffTech, what I'm talking about, government technologies, um, specifically digital government technologies. And there's a, this interface to legal tech. Um, you know, any kind of solutions for lawyers for the for the entire justice system and so forth. Um, that's another interesting interface where there's a lot of um, innovation coming up. Um, so that's helpful with that background from, you know, 30 years ago. Wow. So before we get uh, move on to talking about the Austrian Federal Computing Center, I just want to ask you one more question about management, because you mentioned that you wanted to uh, become a conductor, you studied conducting earlier. And what you said about being a lawyer and being kind of a communication specialist, translating what lawyers would say to uh, uh, digital computer scientists, how is it, how did the management part come about? Because now today you're a manager. Was that something that also interested you? Was that something innate? Or how did your whole management career come about? Well, that, that pretty much came along the line, to be honest. Um, the administrative uh, work as a manager, I mean, to manage my team is something the not necessarily the most appreciated I'm, I have to do each and every day. Um, and I think I'm a good communicator. I'm not really the tough boss, uh, you know, walking on the table and, and saying, you, you need to do this and that. I'm not that kind of guy. I mean, some people were said, you are maybe sometimes too much part of the team and you're too, too friendly, so to say. Uh, but if that's the only uh, accusation, I would say that's okay. Yeah. And so 
somewhere along the line, I picked up, picked up, and I also did some management courses. I, I um, did a certification in project management as a project management professional um, at um, at the Project Management Institute. So you can learn things along the line, and that worked quite well. So your management style, you'd say, is one based on mutual respect. Yeah, which is probably something you should have to do anyway. Um, but um, yeah, and and I don't necessarily like these choleric people who would who would shout and cry, and 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 they would still feel like this is management. I don't think so. It's a question how you how you would approach that. But uh, that's my style, and I think I'm moving. I'm getting along quite well. Fantastic. Let's take a look now at the Austrian Federal Computing Center. The Federal Computing Center, BRZ, is Austria's driving force for digital transformation in the public sector. We operate one of the largest data centers in Austria and guard the country's precious treasury of data. With our IT applications and e-government solutions, we make everyday life easier for 8 million Austrians. The BRZ digitizes and processes 25 million file pages per year. With Österreich GVAT, which is Austria's digital office, many administrative procedures can already be handled electronically and in a mobile way. Mona, the digital office chatbot on Österreich GVAT, supports citizens in dealing with their official business. Chatbot Fred provides virtual support for visitors to finance online. At the BRZ Innovation Factory, we are always breaking new ground in idea generation and together with partners and customers work on rethinking existing administrative processes. New working methods such as Scrum, Design Thinking or Lean enable us to react quickly and efficiently to customer needs and develop creative solutions through teamwork. Our business intelligence solutions and predictive analytics tools are already being successfully used in the administration. The BRZ is part of the European initiative Euritas, which networks government tech companies and acts as a hub for Europe-wide exchange in the fields of e-government and digitization. In the BRZ, more than 1,300 employees shape the digital future of our country. This makes us the most exciting IT workspace in Austria. BRZ – Securing Innovation Fantastic. So, Matthias, tell us more about this Austrian Federal Computing Center. So, it, it seems to uh, have a big mandate to do, uh, and it seems like it would be challenging to go up against Google or Meta or those other companies. <laughs> and uh, so tell me, is that reinventing the wheel or what exactly, what's the purpose of this uh, organization? Well, the, the BRZ, uh, the Bundesrechenzentrum, um, the Federal Computing Center has been in place since almost 40 years as a, um, it used to be the IT department of the Ministry of Finance in, in Austria. So even the applications in the, in the 80s or in the 90s were, were hosted by the so-called Bundesrechenamt. That was just a little, little, little office, but I mean, then it turned into a center, the real data center. And, um, and um, 25, 25 years ago, it was being, transformed into the centralized IT department for the entire government, for each and every ministry and other governmental agencies. So we do have a long history. We're certainly not reinventing the wheel. We do have, for example, this, what was being mentioned, Finance Online, which is a portal for your tax application. Um, it is fully digital and it exists already for more than 10 years. Um, and it's 
um, it's something uh, we are way ahead, for example, compared to Germany in regards to digital solutions, that I think the federal uh, approach um, that each and every state in Austria does have certain responsibilities is not that strong or not intense like it is in Germany. So we can centralize better. Um, so it's a relatively centralized IT and we can execute solutions throughout the country from, from the far east, which is uh, you know Vienna close to the Hungarian border um, and and even even for Alberg, which is like uh, on the border to Switzerland, so across the Alps, so to say, we we are going to be able to centralize that. In in Germany, for example, we there are not necessarily there's not one German uh, real centralized center. There are the sixteen different states with sixteen different data centers, and that is freaking complicated. I can tell you, you know. So it's it's a smaller country, I man. We are. For example, uh, almost kind of as as big, so to say, or with the population of Bavaria, for example. So it's probably a more appropriate to to compare Austria to Bavaria in that sense. So that's why we're also collaborating with Bavaria, for example, in some IT solutions. Okay, and tell us a little bit about your move from Accenture and what you were doing there at Accenture at that time, and how it was. Uh... Clearly, they 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 wanted you to take this new position there uh, at the at the Austrian Federal Computing Center, and then it seems to have been an excellent move for both you and for the Austrian Federal Computing Center. What was it like when you first got there? What 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 did you understand was the Austrian Federal Computing Center then? I somehow knew the Federal Computing Center before because I was part of the so-called um, health and public sector um, segment within Accenture. So I was, um, I was taking care of customers uh, in the public sector in Austria and Germany and, and in Switzerland, which is this, this, this geography uh, by Accenture. And I was already involved in, in a variety of projects in some ministries. And if it's all about IT, then it was obviously connected to the uh, to the federal computer computing center as the ministry of let's say finance have they do have very little of their own solutions uh, hosted by themselves it's uh, everything is hosted just right around the corner in the federal computing center um, so it was obvious that I knew what, what they were doing and, and I was um, you know talking to people even before in my role at, at Accenture um, still it was a move in, in terms of or a change because um, obviously a international uh, consulting company um, is quite different uh, compared to a uh, governmental agency like the uh, federal computing center but um, it was it was uh, sometimes tough in, in in regards to some administrative um, restrictions so to say but I did some uh, my negotiation when I when I negotiated the contract was that I would have a little bit of an, op an opportunity to have a space where we can actually be uh, innovative, where 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 there's a, uh, in, an innovation budget existing, not fully under the control of regular um, you know IT solutions, but we would be able to come up with innovation even before a customer would sign a contract in in that regard to to think about what's going to come next year and three years and that was an important part and that was convincing um, um by the management of the of the computing center to hire me uh, or even for me to say okay that's a new opportunity for me in a in a tough environment but in, a, in an interesting environment to to deal with the government and to move something in regards to innovation. Okay, and Matthias, before we um, take a look at another video, I wanted to ask you, so what is your day like? What, if, if you're gonna explain your work to lay people like me, what is it that you, exactly that you do? I, during the last video, they talked about digitizing documents. So putting documents online, pretty much, you know, transcribing them, 
into digital language so people can view them or download them or whatever. And then the chat bots, chat bots so that the computer is really cutting down on bureaucracy, making the government very uh, available to anybody who can do do governmental things 24 seven. What is it that you do exactly? Well, it's obviously quite diverse, um, but um, you know, it, it, uh, I would say like 50% of the work is, is related to innovation projects we would initiate by ourselves in, in my team. Um, and we, I will show three slides later on for, as an example, the, the digital knowledge butler. And, and another task is um, that we're collaborating with um, startups. And that's what this, this other video is all about. We are uh, trying to convince startups that not only the private commerce related industry out there is interesting to, to come up with innovations, but even the, the government sector is an interesting client. And a lot of people would say it's a, it's a difficult client, but, but on the other hand, um, we are trying to build a environment where it's possible to work with the, the kind of big, relatively big Austrian computer center, 1500 people working over here um, compared to a small startup we are trying to build an environment where they feel comfortable to share their ideas with us and to build joint solutions. On the other hand, we would not. We would tell them what what this what the challenge is going to be, and they would come up with an idea, and we would finance if the if the idea uh, was smart. We would we would put a we would allocate a budget right away to get it going. So that's 50, 60 percent of my work is this innovation I kind of ahead of time. And then there's also their other projects, for example, digital tourism is something um, where there was, it was being budgeted last year to enhance the, the process of, um, of digital tourism in conjunction with uh, registering guests and so forth. And that's a project um, which is interesting and uh, that that's fully funded by the by the client by the um, by the ministry, and uh, but it's an interesting space where there's still a lot of paperwork being done, and uh, this can be avoided. And uh, specifically, a younger generation would expect, uh, and a vacation experience would expect a more digital approach. So. Um, on the one hand, innovation projects on our own, and the other hand, it's uh, interesting interaction with with ministries, clients, um, where they feel like they have particular um, challenges. The one of the most relevant challenges they're facing is a an enormous retirement wave. Um, Forty eight percent of the employees of the public sector uh, in Austria will retire 48 percent within this decade. So within the next eight, eight to nine years, that's a lot, you know, and uh, and so hence artificial intelligence and solutions in that regard is something where we're trying to face that. But um, they, they know that they have an issue. Wow. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, next video. This is a, a startup that the Austrian Federal Computing Center has supported. Is that right? Yeah, right. We we and there's a link. I mean, what they're doing is digitizing um, real estate, the real estate transaction. Hence, there's a logical link to the government, taxes, land registry. Um, I mean, there's only one land, there's no private land registry, there's only one from the government. So, and if you do not have that link, you're not gonna buy any property, neither analog nor digital. So th they had kind of had to work with us, but we also created an environment where they felt comfortable working with us and jointly for, you know, anyone who wants to buy property here and, um, and the government jointly, we're gonna create a digital solution. We supported them they did their first fully digital transaction of a, of a bigger uh, property in Vienna last year, um, and that was quite successful. 
Fantastic. And the video shows how we supported them. Let's take a look at it. Yep. Our world of today is already the world of tomorrow. There are various digital helpers which make our life easier in many different areas. But why don't we have a digital helper for the big decisions in life? Because this is your dream house and it is even up for sale. But you know, the real struggle only starts now. The pile of papers waiting to be filled in shows that it is a long way to get the details on the property. Not to mention the number of contracts you have to sign in case you want to buy the property. In our digital world, the question arises, shouldn't this process be easier? In the near future, yes. Because on our digital real estate platform, a few clicks suffice to find the purchase contract for your dream house. Perfect, standardized, and easy. The suitable financing too is just a click away in your digital wallet. You can contact the seller at any time, make an appointment to visit the property and start negotiations immediately. Thanks to a digital confirmation, the seller knows that your request is serious and financing is possible. One click and you can adapt the details of the contract. If both parties agree, the contract is digitally signed and concluded. You can call in a lawyer for help at any time with just one click. Through the Bundesrechenzentrum, all participating parties are already authenticated and confirmed. A block stamper based on blockchain technology provides for additional security. Hence, buying a property takes little time. In the background, the platform deals with the necessary administrative procedures the secure transfer of the purchase price and the entry into the land register. Start to handle your real estate transactions in a digital, cheap, fast and secure way. Fantastic. So, um, Matthias, so, uh, I'd like also to ask at this time, uh, if anybody has any questions, any of our participants would like to ask a question, please feel free. Matthias is here to answer your questions. Uh, just turn on your microphone and ask or uh, write something in the chat room. He's here for that. So Matthias, tell us a little bit that uh, that that firm has been successful and maybe you could segue into your presentation about GovTech. Yeah, they, they've been uh, quite successful so far, and um, that's in this in this specific field of legal tech and, and gov tech, so to say. That's the link I kind of you know know based upon my background. That's why I also uh, was uh, quite keen to support that. Um, and that's only one example of, of startups where we've been working with uh, so far, um, trying to support them. Um, they don't necessarily have to be Austrian. In this case, it was the fact, but um, but uh, but in the, um, we are trying to. We're also part of a European network. We're trying to foster innovation throughout Europe, um, and um, and it's great if these these startups get successful. So we kind of also created a network, um, a GovTech initiative, where we are one part of the mosaic, so to say. Um, but it's also obviously startups and, and other innovative um, corporations, but it's also other, um, for example, um, subsidy, um, subsidy organizations, um, and it's also the other governments, and it's also, for example, uh, the World Bank, for example, they're interested in it because they built their own uh, GovTech global partnership. And uh, the one hub of the GovTech Global Partnership by the World Bank was being uh, initiated uh, in 2021 in Vienna, which is the third largest uh, location of the World Bank. And uh, it was specifically uh, located here uh, because there's an, an environment where they can actually test and, and uh, create those innovations. And uh, that's why we're in close contact. So that's another level where we Obviously, the World Bank is not our key client, but it's an interesting partner to kind of um, understand what their uh, interest is. And they are also 
interested in, in validating solutions in Austria. So that's why this GovTech network with Austrian startups and other partners is valuable. And we're trying to institutionalize that uh, even more this year. So Matthias, we have some questions coming in from Aaron. What, what are some of the challenges you have in bringing these new technologies to life or in getting people to use them? How do you overcome those challenges? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are obviously a variety of challenges we're, we're facing. Um, there's this, this, this elegant uh, argument saying that there's some grandma out there, uh, up there on a hat uh, in, in, uh, on a hut in, in, in uh, Upper Austria. She wouldn't have internet access and that's why we're not allowed to build this digital solution. I said, okay, we have to overcome this. I mean, if I understand that we're missing a certain percentage and uh, this is, but this is not an argument to not to do it, so to say, you know, that's one aspect. The other thing is um, um, procurement of innovation solutions. This is still a challenge because if a small startup would eventually have a real smart idea, they, in the government sector, you would typically have to go through a tender process, eventually even a European tender process, and they would ask for international or at least European references, um, so and so many installations with so and so many clients, but they are a startup from Austria or from Sweden, so they do not have those kind of references, so that's why we are unable to procure those innovations. So that's a challenge. We, we've just been uh, collaborating with our legal department, with the ministries last year to do fast lane, quick pitches, um, opportunities to, to procure innovation. That's another challenge. And there was there certainly some more. Um, there's always someone who would say, this is legally impossible. I mean, Thomas Seba, he's, he just joined um, he's the CEO of real estate, uh, the video we've just seen. And uh, he certainly got uh, the accusation that um, a, a, a transfer of a property in a fully digital way is impossible and legally absolutely not binding or whatever. Yeah. And, um, and I mean, but he was able to do this last year, to execute this last year. So you just have to be stubborn and um, consistent on your way. Mr. C Mr. Saber, would you like to uh, respond to that? Welcome. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Matthias. So uh, just one information to start. I, uh, of course, watched uh, the, the full uh, webinar. And now I switched from Facebook to Zoom. So for this reason, uh, I appear here now. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, Matthias for your input. Uh, yes, Matthias, of course, is right. Uh, when we uh, started, and indeed I'm uh, even a lawyer here in Vienna, uh, everybody told us that it's not possible and you cannot do it and it's legally not binding. And uh, indeed, at the end, uh, even if uh, uh, COVID did help a little bit, uh, we were able uh, to change uh, the law. And uh, now uh, yes, it's possible uh, here in Austria to have a fully digital uh, real estate uh, transaction and um, of course uh, it was uh, quite a success and uh, even here in our law firm uh, quite often we have uh, clients uh, from all over the world uh, and they are uh, quite happy uh, that it's not uh, anymore necessary to go to the notary public and uh, just to sign the contract uh, digitally. So uh, we, show, we uh, demonstrated that uh, it's, it's possible uh, even if uh, somebody told us it's it's not possible. <laughs> so, Mr. Saber, you would say then the ease of doing business in Austria is definitely uh, easier than in other European countries at this time. Uh, yes, I'm. Uh, yes, I, I can confirm. So uh, we work quite a lot uh, with uh, Germany. We work quite a lot with uh, Italy. And uh, in both uh, countries, uh, it's uh, more complicated, uh, especially when it comes uh, to real estate uh, transactions. 
uh, I think uh, we have uh, a very uh, advanced system. Uh, of course, uh, thanks uh, to BRZ uh, here in, in, in Austria. And uh, for example, uh, you can uh, have access uh, to the contracts digitally, uh, just uh, uh, one click. Uh, so you can uh, have a view uh, of the contracts regarding uh, plots of, of real estate. And this, for example, is not possible uh, in, 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 not in Germany. Wow. Well, congratulations to Mr. Saber. Congratulations to you, Matthias, for your fantastic work uh, moving, uh, moving business in Austria. So we have another question here. Perhaps uh, Mr. Saber would like to also uh, give his opinion after Matthias. The question is from Jerry Callahan. Where does the real estate platform leave the real estate broker? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Probably you, Thomas, would be able to, because they still want to be in business and uh, not, not necessarily resting on the bridge. So, so uh, how do you integrate them, Thomas? Uh, wow. Well, uh, so uh, brokers, of course, and uh, even uh, lawyers, are uh, still uh, part of the game and I personally am quite uh, sure and happy uh, that uh, both uh, uh, have to change uh, have to change uh, their uh, business models and I think uh, neither the lawyer nor uh, the other service provider will disappear but uh, I think uh, they are only paid uh, if they provide a service so uh, it's not enough uh, just uh, to give uh, the key to the client and uh, to tell him, yes, and you can see now uh, the apartment, um, but uh, service is required. And uh, for this reason, uh, we uh, tried hard to integrate uh, lawyers and uh, even uh, agents uh, in the platform. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the platform uh, and the service provider have to, to work together. And at the end, I'm uh, convinced uh, that real estate, real estate transactions uh, are uh, getting uh, cheaper. And uh, of course, this uh, regards uh, the lawyer fees, uh, then uh, the agent fees, um, then even uh, the bank uh, fees. And um, I think uh, here, uh, digitalization uh, is, is a step ahead. And maybe just to comment on this, I mean, we realized that, um, which was being mentioned in the video anyway, that the interaction between a human, for example, an attorney um, providing consulting and regarding in regards to the contract is still important. So human interaction, these days, but even in better times, this interaction is not in a physical meeting, not necessarily. Yeah? Specifically with uh, 30,000 new infections in Austria today, you know, but even, even, even after this, you know, uh, that's what, how we learned a little from this. Um, and and Thomas uh, um, is a good example, but even apart from that, we built another um, innovation project where there's, it's not only a video call with, um, but we call it digital government appointment. And it's on the left side, you would see the other person, the government expert, and on the, on the right side, you would be looking at a form, at a contract, at a document, which you would execute. Together, you as, an, as a governmental expert, you would execute that with me as a citizen. And we would run through the form, run through the contract, and you can ask questions and so forth. And then in the end, you can fill it in, all the necessary information, and then you would sign digitally and then it's done. So it's a real appointment without showing up at the governmental office. And uh, that's, a, that's a lessons learned. We're, we're continuing to develop um, uh, online sessions with, uh, with on online meetings, uh, with decision-making and so forth. So that's, that's a, a learning curve uh, we went through uh, still human interaction is important, even if, if it's digital. Okay. And we still know that, that having a coffee in, in this approach on Zoom is not the best way, 
but if it's an official appointment and you you don't necessarily have to get there physically, that's uh, that's something which is uh, beneficial. So uh, one more question we have from Professor Lino Rivera of St. Mary's College of California. Lino, hi. Hello, uh, Matias. Hello there. Uh, it's so interesting that you uh, lived in Berkeley. I live 10 kilometers from Berkeley. Uh, I, I actually have three questions. Uh, number one and most important is, how does your musical um, training and education help you in your present job? Uh, number two, um, has this been uh, this particular interest in your life right now with regards to technology? Uh, has this been a nascent or latent interest in you before you um, get got into this particular line of discipline? And number three, do you still do music? So the last one, I still do music, yes. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, music is a certain influence, uh, um, no doubt. Um, and I mean, for example, I'm, I'm a jazz violinist and, and, um, and uh, which is a very kind of a niche within jazz, you know, a gypsy swing and that kind of stuff. I mean, I don't have to explain that to you, but, but to others eventually. And, uh, and there, um, August Wilhelm Scheer, he was the, the, the head, uh, the CEO of IDS Share, a large software company in Germany. He's also a pretty good baritone saxophone player. And he had um, already um, sessions and conferences where we, he would combine improvisation in a jazzy style with uh, doing management and innovation. So his idea, and, and which I, which I kind of like, which, which adapts me, is that uh, in, a, in a jazz format, you would have four to the bar. On, on the, the one, you need, to, you need to adapt to the chord so that it fits quite okay-ish um, to the chord from the you know, guitar or piano. But at the two and the three and the four, you are very, very flexible. It, you can do any kind of innovation and experimental type of approach. But ideally, if it's not hardcore experimental jazz, if it's like more standard jazz, easy listening jazz, you have to get back to the tune, so to say, back on track on the next number one, on the, on the next one, so to say. And that approach is something I like. You can transfer this to management and you can say, okay, we're going to give you, we, we, there is a certain frame I, I have to be part of in a large corporation like this. I'm in, I'm in, the, I'm in management, but I, I have to put myself into a certain framework of which uh, if I'm leaving this framework all the time to just do experimental innovation, this is difficult to handle. But if I'm using this, this on the one, I'm, I'm here and then I can have two, three, four as a flexible approach. This is a, a nice spider net of, of innovation I can bring in. And this is a, certainly this um, in innovation slash improvisation fits together quite well. And it's yeah. also songwriting is another uh, topic I'm, I'm working on. Um, songwriting is a is an inspiration. It has a certain structure. You want to have a verse, and you want to have a chorus, and you want to tell a story. Um, but within that, you should be creative, and that's what I. That's why I like it either. Thank you for that. You know, I will share that with my students. <laughs> it's a it's a pretty you know I didn't invent it. It was August William Shea, but. Uh, it's this pretty smart concept of, of um, using this. And he had people in the session, they are not necessarily musicians at all. They're just managers you know, or, or, I mean, consultants. But they had to understand they were listening to music and they were listening to the, to the pure melody. And then they were listening to the level of improvisation. And then they were realizing, ah, okay, this is based upon this. Okay, I got it. And this is how they were flexible, still getting back to the point. And um, yeah, so uh, I, I like those sessions. Extraordinary. 
So Matt, uh, maybe uh, in the uh, final minutes remaining, would you be able to tell us more about GovTech? I know that you have a little short presentation to show us. Well, I, um, I want to um, um, primarily, let me, let me see what, what I have over here, uh, show a um, very much GovTech related um, innovation uh, project. Um, which is this this um, knowledge butler, uh, but I uh, I do have some issues here. Um, um, okay, um, and I will um, uh, I will uh, around this I will just explain some some of the GovTech approach. I do have uh, I can share um, via this button here one second or i can share for you if you like no well, i i have it um all right so this this is this is it um can you can you see the presentation yes perfectly okay so um i mean the the scuff tech network is certainly um based upon a collaboration between different actors, um, like, as I said, um, startups, uh, even associations like Austrian startups, that's uh, like the association of Austrian startups, but even connecting to other similar associations in Europe. Uh, and then we do have um, agencies providing subsidies. We do have um, partners like um, the European Commission or um, like the, the World Bank. And we certainly do have the Austrian government as a real life example. And we realized in, in these GovTech sessions that knowledge um, is an important factor. And this digital knowledge battle is an excellent example of a GovTech innovation project because that wouldn't work only with us. The idea is to build a Austrian landscape of, or, or, or ma Austrian map of knowledge, and it should be extended to Europe. So it's it's something we cannot do on our own. We have to uh, partner with uh, with others in, in this area. So that's why I wanted to show it because it's a perfect example how to collaborate with with startups. They would have ideas. What we do here is we. We, we created a framework and a we we kind of presented a challenge. I already mentioned this enormous retirement wave. Um, so we presented this challenge and we we are we already integrated and we are in the process of still integrating other startups uh, from the GovTech area to enhance that because it's a substantial problem. Yeah? So it's all about um, digitalization and knowledge retention. Yeah? I mean, if, if these people retire and you don't do anything, you will lose that type of knowledge, obviously. So you, you have to work on this. So it's a loss of workforce, um, but you might be able to somehow um, kind of um, reduce the issue a little bit in regards to automation. I mean, you would, so the plan would be to only um, onboard new uh, two out of three. So that means if three um, three employees would retire, you would only onboard two out of the three, um, and maybe one out of the three jobs would be partly automated at least. That was the plan. But as we all know, there's knowledge specifically on this hard drive up here. You know, this you, you probably know this hard drive up here, and you have hopefully have access to this hard drive. Um, so uh, there's some knowledge which is something you need, you just need to know. There's no artificial intelligence or automated robot which would be able to help. And that's why we said we need to do something um, specific in regards to knowledge retention. So what we, we considered was a knowledge butler. There's certainly a human level on here and there's a butler. Uh, this butler is a mobile application which would 
uh, require you to answer questions in an audio format. It's 100 seconds. And um, you are, let's say, an expert for music, uh, Lino, for example. And, and there's a specific question in regards to what is the most important opera by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart? And you would be able to, to explain that. And because this is eventually something, I mean, obviously Mozart is fully documented, but there are a lot of areas in the government which are not appropriately documented at all. There's a lot of knowledge somewhere here, but if this guy is retired or this, this lady is gonna retire, there's a huge problem. So. Um, the butler will ask you a question. There was going to be an audio recording. Um, there will be an audio library uh, available. Uh, so a, a variety of 100 second audio uh, sets. So you can listen to this as a net with your natural intelligence. And at the same time, via speech to text, we will use this to fill up those gaps in, in the underlying artificial intelligence platform so that we can consistently uh, work on this. And, um, and the key is, and, and this is a process still in the beginning somehow, that not only uh, uh, the butler will ask a human, but also the, the, art, the underlying artificial intelligence platform would consistently learn what, what the platform would know. And it will also learn what they would not know what the platform uh, has, where the platform has no documented knowledge to provide for any assistant, for any any human being or or chatbot. So, and based upon a gap or a, um, a a desert, so to say, in in terms of the the knowledge map, um, the the artificial intelligence uh, platform would initiate via this orchestrator here. Um, would initiate a um, uh, a butler asking a particular expert to fill this gap. So I'm sorry, KI is is AI because it's künstliche Intelligenz, so it's artificial intelligence. I didn't I've got to translate that. So um, just to make sure that you're going to be able to understand that. So basically, um, it's an opportunity on the one hand that the, the platform would learn. What the, what, what the platform knows and what, what it wouldn't know. But it's also another opportunity, assuming Lino, I, I, I had been uh, triggering my butler to ask your butler something about a particular topic. And I kind of appreciated, uh, likely I appreciated what you were uh, recording there, this 100 seconds then I can ask my butler to ask your butler whether we're going to have a coffee, eventually a virtual coffee, but maybe even at some point a physical coffee. And uh, so your butler will ask you, is it okay if you're going to have, if I was going to arrange a coffee with a virtual coffee with Matt? And then you can still reject, obviously, because you have other things to do, obviously. Yeah. Or if you were willing to to spend some time, you can say uh, yes, okay, please arrange it for me. So that's that's this generation contract I'm talking about that humans, youngsters and seniors would get together. And the last comment is, most of the time, in regards to specific uh, knowledge and experience, um, the youngsters youngsters would learn from the seniors. But in the digital world, with digital education and knowledge, it can be vice versa. It can be uh, in, a, in a sense that the youngsters was, would teach the seniors all about digitalization, how to use uh, um, how to use digital tools and so forth. So that's why it's a vice versa generation contract. So it's integrating technology, but also the human factor. So that should be a good example. And you can understand that this is something we have to build with the GovTech community if it was only, we kind of built the framework and the, and the concept, but now we need this impulse, this innovation impulse from outside. Extraordinary. So um, Matt, how, how, how far are you in this digital knowledge butler? Have you already, has it already gone online or are you 
Is it going to go online in a few months? Yeah, it's the it's um, the, the the first um, fully operational type of version, including the the access to the uh, AI platform is available. Going to is going to be available in March. But what we already do have is we do have an Austrian startup. They called they're called Audvice A U D Vice. So instead of Advice, it's Audvice. Um, they are already doing audio recording. Uh, in regards to a digital library where you can listen to, so that's something we don't have to we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There is an Aust there's a, a startup from Salzburg. They are they are specialized on this only on this, and uh, what we we would just take it one step further in regards to speech to text, but um, we are using them. So this is what we already done. We record already recorded a variety of, of 100 seconds uh, information building blocks, so to say, and we also do have or the the artificial intelligence platform since yet last year. Uh, this is existing, so we're currently connecting the dots, but we're already uh, somewhere down the line, uh, down the road, um, uh, and uh, we're convinced that that this is going to be an interesting application. So we just need to put the, the the stuff together. And Matthias, returning to Aaron's question about overcoming challenges, getting people to use <laughs> this work, do you have a plan for that for this rollout? How do you see that? And have you already had some? What kind of reactions? What kind of response reception do you uh, do you anticipate? Well, it's yeah. I mean, some of the reactions are if I was going to say that the artificial intelligence platform is going to learn whatever the platform would not know. This is something where most of the even even so-called experts would say, oh, "Oh no, this is never going to work. Never." even though they had they didn't do any research on, on AI and, and stuff. But I mean, they would say, this is impossible, you know? Well, I say, I mean, we verified this. It is, I mean, it's a, it's a process, it's a journey. Yeah, it's not gonna be perfect on day one, but I mean, it's possible. Um, that's, that's one thing. And then the other thing was, um, who is actually, uh, uh, is this going to work? Who is going to listen? To um, to these 100 seconds. I mean, this, so so variety of challenges. But then, for example, we combined a knowledge building block um, with uh, two interesting pieces of music, um, and we also want to want to uh, turn this into a kind of a podcast, so to say. You can select wh whatever music you like, yeah, and. I'm going to present to you like two bands you have never heard of, but pretty cool music, or a new recording of Mendelssohn's piano trio, which is great. And in the middle, there's this building block, and the people were listening to these nine minutes uh, mini podcasts, and they loved it. I just, I said, just said, don't, don't ask anything, don't, don't criticize, just listen. And they said, wow, even the music would support the understanding of the, of the actual building block. So how to overcome challenges? This, this, this is a one little bit creative type of approach, just as an example. But it certainly would not necessarily work all the time, I have to, I have to admit. And there we come 360 back to music once again to your versatile multifaceted career always inspiring so last question for you matthias what do you hope your legacy will be you have uh, done so many things you have so many things left to do uh, so much unfinished business that uh, apparently only you can do with all of your talents with your management skills with your legal and artistic skills Tell us what uh, what do you hope for the future? What uh, legacy do you hope uh, to to leave the next generation? Like you said, when you are a senior and you're exchanging with youngsters. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> what I'd like to what I'd like to point out is is uh, that you can always learn, and there's no reason to say. Um, 
I'm I'm old or I'm going to be retiring soon, so I'm not going to jump into this whole digital crap. Um, and uh, and on the other hand, uh, I would certainly want to create an environment for young people in the government. This this is a matter of uh, of a you know workplace you have to turn into something digital natives would appreciate. Um, so that's a little bit of a legacy. Um, I would get across. You can learn from each other. This is why I like this generation contract, so to say, and that's important for me. I'm not a digital native either, but I I just kind of kind of uh, all of a sudden came into this. Um, but I, I liked it. And um, the other thing is being creative in this this way of, of uh, disruptive innovation. I mean, disruptive is a little bit of a term which is being in use too often and not for, for, for stuff which is not necessarily really disruptive, um, but really to be different, to think from a different angle and um, and not to stop. I mean, people were saying, Nobody in the, uh, these super correct governmental people, these employees, they will never listen to this music podcast. And I said, "Come on, this, there's there's a there's a you know knowledge building block in the middle." N nobody would listen. And then I said, "Okay, so it turned out differently, yeah." Um, so be consistent and be stubborn to a certain extent. Um, yes. Uh, or presented sometimes you fail yeah but presented and sometimes it's it's better not to talk too much about it but just to do it and that's a little bit of a legacy i i would and, and this should also be possible in the public sector so i would like to turn these um this attitude which is eventually even super funky sexy at uh, microsoft or google or wherever you come from I mean, maybe the Bundesrechenzentrum wouldn't turn out uh, with such a sexy name, but I want to point out where I want to show, uh, even, even when I retire, that it's possible to do innovation in that creative approach in the public sector, not even in Austria. And if this is, if I was able to contribute to this to a certain extent, I'm, I'm happy to retire at a certain point still integrating my knowledge eventually in a digital type of way, but still also enjoying my retirement. Okay. Let's see how we can stay in contact with Matthias. Here is the Federal Computing Center website. It is brz.govgv.at. And there it is. And you can just click on contact if you like and reach out to them. So I will put that in the chat room. But you can certainly contact and, me also via, yeah, you just want to mention that. And then we have Matthias LinkedIn. So look him up, Matthias Lichtenhaller on LinkedIn. And people can reach out to you that way, Matthias? Yeah, for sure. Happy to connect. Um, very much uh, looking forward to comments, um, uh, constructive criticism, or whatever it is. So, uh, but be creative, please. Fantastic. So, thank you so very much, Matthias. Thank you for inspiring us and showing us that digitization is for all of us. And uh, in fact, uh, we may even have a duty to take part in this important change in, in our world. Thank you very much for inviting me. So we have, let's take a look at next week. We have Father James Martin, Society of Jesus, learning to pray. Father James Martin of the Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuits, speaks softly, but his words always have a lasting impact on his audience. This missionary to his own homeland doesn't like confrontation, but he welcomes it when an open and inclusive church is at the stake. Even those who don't quote unquote like Martin probably admit that he is a courageous follower of Christ. Perhaps that's why he is among the most respected church voices of today and was appointed as consultor to the Vatican Secretariat for Communications by the very Pope himself. 
So what's Martin's secret? How did he get from successful Ivy League business student to Fortune 500 businessman to editor and editor at large of America Magazine? He probably would not hesitate to tell you that it all started with prayer. The paperback edition of his latest book, Learning to Pray, A Guide for Everyone, takes the reader through the ups and downs Martin has celebrated and struggled with as he, even as an accomplished man of the cloth, learns to pray. Come welcome Father Jim to our show, and he will show us how prayer truly is meant for everyone. As always, all information about upcoming shows may be found at www.simeonmorrow.com. So we have Jerry Callahan who writes, thank you, Matthias, very interesting conversation. And Aaron writes, thank you, Matthias. So once again, and also I would like to thank Matthias Lichtenthaler, I'd like uh, to thank very much uh, Thomas Saber, Lino Rivera. Thank you to Aaron and to Jerry Callahan for participating. Thanks very much to Agnieszka Rivole for her support of this show. Most of all, thanks to you, all of our participants who make it all worthwhile. From Vienna, Austria, from New London, New Hampshire, from the Bay Area, California, goodbye and see you next Wednesday. Thank you, pleasure.